The year is 2014, and a new type of architectural typology has now been revealed. Bosco Verticale, or Vertical Forest. It had positive critiques at first, incredible visual appeal, and a bold implementation of gardening on a large urban scale. But experts started to question if this typology was actually sustainable. How much energy is required to upkeep this building? How much material is used? The project started a very important conversation, and it can be distilled into one simple question. How do architects design sustainably? This video is a general overview of what architects consider when trying to design sustainably. It's divided into these small self-contained points. So you can choose what you want to see if you don't want to watch the whole video. Chapters are below. At the end of the video, we'll take another look at Bosco Verticale. And my hope is that as you watch this video, you'll get a greater understanding of what it means to truly design sustainably. So let's get into it. The very first thing an architect considers when designing sustainably before anything else is the position of the building relative to the sun. You have to respect the big fireball upstairs because it dictates so much. It mandates how the building is naturally heated, how much solar shading is necessary, and it determines the requirements for artificial climate control. It makes it incredibly necessary for an architect to do a site analysis. Is wind ventilation possible? What's the topography like? Are there coniferous or deciduous plant species on site? What an architect looks for when doing a site analysis is in what ways the natural elements of the site helps control the temperature of the building. It's really important from a sustainability perspective because we want to see all the ways that we can harmonize with the natural elements of the site and reduce our design intervention. The most neglected conversation in sustainable design is insulation. It is a crime how no one is talking about our values in any comment section. So for a moment, let's talk about the unsung hero of sustainability. It is the moderator of a building's heat exchange. Good insulation can reduce the dependency on energy, but most importantly, it regulates a comfortable living environment. Many architects tackle the wall assembly problem early on in design, and that's because they need to figure out what the resistance rating or R value is required for the project. It not only decides the viability of sustainable design, but it also dictates how the exterior envelope of the wall is assembled. For any architecture student watching, thermal bridging and thermal break. Your professor will be impressed if you know what that is. So I encourage you in your next debate to bring up insulation. Let them know that it certainly deserves a place in the conversation. Guys, I get it. Everyone has their favorite energy resource, whether you're a solar sister or a hydro powered homie. When it comes to choosing the right energy resource for your project, you really have to consider what's best for the building's needs. Does the building see enough sunlight through the year? Is it near a large body of water? Can geothermal provide enough energy? I think there's this misconception that everyone thinks to just choose the most sustainable option. But in reality, each project comes with its own requirements. An architect has to consider resource availability, energy demand, cost and economic viability, building integration, regulatory and legal factors, environmental impact, longevity and reliability, aesthetic impact, community and stakeholder engagement. It's a lot, but I wouldn't get discouraged. Everyone is aware of the environmental issues we face, and everyone is certainly realizing the importance of finding new ways to power our home. Please do not forget about water when talking about sustainability. But for many of you, you may not know what that means for architectural design. You see, architects have a knack for designing some incredible surfaces, roofs that curve, shelters that shade, and even some imaginative things you may not have thought of. But there's this thing called precipitation. Managing water as it moves across any surface is certainly under the scope of work for an architect. So instead of choosing the aesthetic surface, water runoff has become more and more prevalent. Great examples of water management and sustainable design can be bioswales, it can be green roofs, or it can even be permeable concrete. Understanding our place in the water cycle and designing a project that disrupts this process as little as possible is something worth someone's time and consideration. What is the most water consuming thing in your home? It must be dishwashers. Older models certainly take up a lot of water. Flushing can waste up to six gallons of water. Wait a second, it must be lawn watering. Those things consume water like nothing else. Water consumption is an important thing to consider for oneself and for an architect when designing a building as well. Fire suppression systems take up vast amounts of water when activated or being tested. Many buildings use water cooled systems for air conditioning and water is a critical component in concrete production as well. These choices become even more important, especially when designing in a climate with limited water or places that are incredibly susceptible to drought. An architect has a fantastic opportunity to help limit the amount of water consumed with every design decision that can go into a project. It's all to say that water consumption certainly starts with you. But if you hire a good architect, they can design you a project that can help you reduce your water consumption. Imagine you're in the washroom 
and you run out of toilet paper. Would it be nice if an architect designed the building out of reusable paper rolls? Well, such was the case from the architect Shikiruba. But don't take it from me, listen to the man himself. As you see in the photo, inside the toilet. In case you finish with toilet paper, you can tear us off inside the wall. <laughs> So it's very useful. It's an incredible quote, but more importantly, it points out how viable it is to design with sustainable materials. Plastics can be reused and repurposed for new structures. Materials that can grow back quickly will cut down on waste and sourcing these materials nearby can reduce emissions from transportation. Choosing materials for a project should be more about just efficient building practices. It should be about building responsibly because at the end of the day, they're not just materials anymore. They're a statement of values and everyone is informed enough to see what the material selection of a building says about an owner or a developer's stance on sustainability. Are you aware of the life cycle of objects around you? Consider a plastic water bottle. It starts with the extraction of raw materials. Then the manufacturing of the bottle itself, the product is transported, shipped to a specific location. We use it and enjoy it. And finally, it's discarded the majority of the time as a single use product. The life cycle assessment or LCA of a water bottle highlights its incredibly significant environmental footprint but it can be improved by switching to a multi-use water bottle. This concept isn't new, but what many of you might not know is that this life cycle assessment also applies to architectural design as well. Bamboo grows quickly and sequesters carbon at a higher rate. Rammed earth provides excellent thermal mass, reducing heating and cooling needs. Green roofs can improve the environmental impact of a building during its use phase. When we pay attention to the life cycle of things and we choose to invest in objects or buildings that last, we become more sustainable. We choose discipline instead of convenience and we start to make choices that help us shape sustainable lifestyles. Take a look at these two pictures for a moment. Two very contrasting examples of urban streets, but it's so obvious which one is better. We have shade creation reducing the urban heat island effect, biodiversity providing crucial habitats for insects and animals, an improvement of mental health and well-being for residents. We know the benefits of urban landscapes prioritizing greenery, and architects are constantly trying to find ways to incorporate this in infrastructure as well. Green walls provide insulation and shading. Green roofs establish biodiverse habitats and water management. And of course, aesthetic appeal. There's this incredible movement in architecture to try and find the right balance between trying to incorporate the built environment with green infrastructure. It can make one really optimistic, especially if architects continue to design in harmony with the natural world and find that perfect balance between sustainable design and a natural means of construction. It's time to show some landscape architects some love. Their job isn't just to plant something pretty. There's multiple avenues these professionals take to make our lives better and more sustainable. They champion native plant species that protect against local pesticides. They have this uncanny ability to foster habitats and natural environments. And they have the site to sculpt terrain, which makes them real life earthbenders. I know I'm being reductive about their profession, but I always enjoy getting a chance to work with them. I learn about the need for erosion control and site analysis. I enjoy collaborating with them for biodiversity enhancement, and I enjoy the education of carbon sequestration. Landscape architects play a pivotal role in the way our environment is designed today. And with the future looking to become more green, their knowledge and skills will be relied upon even more. So the next time you walk through a green space or through a well landscaped entry, Understand that a landscape architect took the time to design that well and hopefully make that more sustainable. Now, sometimes as hard as an architect may try, they can't design for everything. A tsunami wipes a coastal town away. A hurricane floods part of a state. An earthquake shakes infrastructures to a pulp. But what an architect can do is design a little bit more resiliently. I've talked about this before in another video, but to gently remind you, resilient design can be sustainable as well. Consider temporary housing, earthquake resistant buildings, or even a home designed to protect against wildfires. Being aware that designing permanent rigid structures in areas that are prone to natural disasters is irresponsible, as much as it's not sustainable. Having to rebuild structures over and over again, instead of using reusable materials or designing to be more resilient and adaptable is a means for those who are ignorant or for those who don't care about one simple truth. Climate change is real and buildings simply need to be able to adapt. So you know all there is to know about sustainability. You're a green guru, an eco warrior, a sustainability sage. You contribute to your community and you help those around you. But 
How do you keep architects accountable? You can certainly ask your questions and you can certainly do your research, but there's a simpler way. Many buildings that endeavor to be sustainable have certifications. The most common designation is LEED, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. While not a perfect system, it does offer the framework for architects to design more sustainably. They would have to meet energy requirements, sort materials correctly, and even prove that their construction methods are sustainable as well. There can be different design certifications depending on where you are in the world, but what this does is empower you. The next time a project is under community review, you can ask if there will be any green certifications that the project will be designed for. At the end of the day, you need to be able to keep architects accountable for what they design. Because we live in a time where sustainability shouldn't be the standard, but simply the norm. So now that we have a very general overview of design, let's take another look at Bosco Verticale. I think at first glance, that idea of a vertical forest works really well with that concept of green roofs and green walls. But I think in this particular project, it's misleading how much energy is required to upkeep this system. The material resources and the water requirements give the system a high environmental cost. And this negates the purpose of these two green infrastructures in the first place. But something else is the cost to maintain this green facade. The high cost of construction and maintenance is often passed to the residents of the building. And it really negates copying this typology in different urban and economic landscapes. Finally, I think this typology leans more towards aesthetics rather than a holistic community-driven approach to designing sustainably. I feel as though it's a means to drive rent prices up rather than lowering costs. It's this really strange version of green gentrification. I think Bosco Verticale was innovative for its time, but its long-term sustainability across ecological, economical, and societal dimensions is really debatable. Without really addressing these broader concerns, I think Bosco Verticale remains more of a symbol rather than a standard for future sustainability developments. But that's just my opinion. I would love to hear what your thoughts are as well. Feel free to post what you think in the comment section below. And if you've watched this far, consider subscribing. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next video.